Hello to everyone uh, out there. I hope you're all drawing. I've, I've realized that a lot of people are tuning in now just for something kind of chill and motivational to listen to while you're in the midst of your creative endeavor. So I'd love to hear what you're working on. Uh, go ahead and drop that in the comments. I'd love to hear if you're working on your, your new comic, if you're working on character designs for a portfolio, environment designs for a portfolio. If you're working on your animation portfolio, if you're programming your indie game, I want to know, I want to know what you're working on. So drop that in the comments below. As you know, I'm keeping pretty busy. We just got that publishing deal for the Twilight Monk game. And I talked a little bit about it in my last video. I've been keeping real busy. So the format of my YouTube channel is shifting up to just be a little bit more cash, a little bit more uh, relaxed. I'm trying to do a little bit more long form in the sense that you know, we're probably going to go like 20 or 20 minutes or so on this one. Uh, the artwork that you're watching me paint in this video is a, a lost video. Uh, when I originally released the sketch portion of this Master Yabata painting, I only had half, the first half of the painting, and I recently uncovered the actual color pass. And you can, you're going to see me doing a lot with like gradient maps, one of my favorite cheats, one of my favorite Photoshop cheats. Uh, I paint with gradient maps. And uh, you're going to see me use it, pulling out all the stops. This was one of my favorite uh, character designs that I've ever done. And Master Yabata will be featured in the Twilight Monk video game. He is featured in the Twilight Monk novel series, uh, The Secrets of Kung Fulio. And he appears again in Return of the Ancients, which was the second book that came out. These are full-length novels. Helped uh, uh, Chris Krubeck helped me to write these. In fact, it was a... Uh, incredible collaboration. Hopefully we can do a lot more after we finish up with the next game. Anyways, so dudes, today we're going to be talking about, the topic today is about a hireable attitude. Uh, I do a lot of hiring. I've run an art house since I left Blizzard and I left Riot. I, I started an art house years ago, uh, probably about 2012, 2013. Uh, after I had done a bunch of work on Summoner's Rift over at Riot, I was like, ah, I'm not a studio guy anymore. I need to run my own business. And so I started hiring artists. And this was very difficult uh, because hiring, if you run a business, you know that hiring is the hardest part. Staffing and managing your staff is the hardest part of running any business. It's not even about the product. It's not even about marketing. The biggest challenge is finding reliable employees and reliable uh, contractors, reliable people for your team that communicate well and that aren't going to be more hassle than actually making the product. <laughs> You'd be surprised. And, and so you start to look for warning signs of, of the wrong type of people to hire. And, and after enough experience, you start to whittle things down. And, and that's not to say that a person who's not hireable today isn't hireable in five years. You know, people change and people evolve and people grow. And some people don't, you know, uh, but certainly there are personality types that uh, sometimes I would say, even if a person is not skilled enough for what I'm looking for, they have what I would like to call the right attitude. And uh, the right attitude can simply be somebody who I know I'm going to have an easy time working with because they display certain characteristics and qualities, which I will dig into. In fact, I want to start with the positive. <laughs> it's Friday. I want to go. I want to start with the up, upbeat, up note uh, of discussing good characteristics, things that maybe you could adopt if you're looking to get work, and you, you know, maybe you just don't know why. Maybe sometimes you don't make it through the interview process, or maybe it's your cover letter that's not helping you to get the job. Basically, just things that you might want to show or showcase in the way that you present your artwork, the way that you present your material, the way that you present your portfolio, and maybe even the way that you speak to somebody that is considering hiring you. And I'm recently going through this because I'm, I am currently hiring. I should mention this even in this casual format. I hope that there are still people who will pass the word along. I'm looking for an unreal engine expert, somebody who can help us with programming the twilight monk game. We just switched engines to the unreal engine as we're going into full development. 
uh, as we are fully funded. And we're looking for an Unreal Engine developer. That means somebody who can program in Blueprints or C++, it doesn't matter, as long as they're, they've got examples of shipped games, not just, oh, you did a few tutorials and here you go. No, I need, we need to find somebody who's really good with Unreal Engine that can show us things that we don't already know. So uh, we're also looking for a 2D animator and I am interviewing and passing out tests for these roles right now. And of course, as you guys know, I do paid tests. I never ask somebody to do a test for free, uh, but uh, that's a different topic for a different story. I won't give somebody a test that I don't think they have a good chance. And you can check out the Aquatic Moon website for more information on that role. So the, the right kind of attitude, I would say, because I recently went through this. Uh, so there was a person who uh, applied for the role of the animator role, and this person, was very uh one they showed a great deal of respect for me and and the the game that i'm making like they are a fan of uh the twilight monk universe they showcased that in their cover letter the artwork that they were showing the animations that they were showing were really from a different genre it's a bit of a stretch that this person would do the kind of kung fu action that we really need for this game. But I want to give this person a try. I don't know if they'll be able to do what we need, but there were factors in their portfolio and, and not just in their, their demo reel, but in their email that showed me this person is one really eager to learn. I think that that's such a key aspect, a key uh, element to applying for a role, especially when it's something where you really want that job and you really respect the people that you're applying to. Um, showing that you are eager to learn new things and eager to try new things. I had mentioned to this person uh, that we're looking for somebody, we're working in Unreal Engine, and this animator is like, oh, I'd, I would love to dig into effects and things like that. So that kind of shows me that this is a person who, even though they may not necessarily have examples of exactly the skill set that we're looking for, they're, they're going to be eager to be adaptable to serve whatever function we need for the game's development. It's not just about their idea of what they want to do. Because I don't want to hire somebody, and I, I can't speak for all employers, but they generally don't want to hire somebody who's the wrong person for that job. I have had employees that worked with me that told me that the client was wrong. And they did it differently anyway, and they refused to, to do the thing that the client wanted. And so that proved to me that this is not a person that I'm going to be able to continue to work with because the client's always right. The client's going, they know what they want. And if they're working with an artist that's telling them, no, 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 you guys don't know. We're, <laughs> we're gonna, we gave you what you need, not what you asked for. Uh, the client is generally going to be fairly unhappy with that. They're going to be disappointed and frustrated. While simultaneously, you do want somebody that's eager to show new possibilities, somebody who can level up what the client wants. So giving them what they're asking for and then some, you know, so even though we are somewhat limited in our camera view for our game, for example, you know, I'm hoping that this person who's used to working with move, movable cameras and uh, more comedic timing, that maybe this animator, because they are so eager to learn and uh, eager to prove themselves and eager to be a part of this type of project, that maybe they're going to really hone in on new ways to do things that we're not already doing. You know, I don't just want an automaton. Now, this kind of changes as you look at bigger studios. When you start looking at studios that have 500 plus developers, they tend to, I don't want to say they want automatons, but they do want people who are singularly focused generally. And if you work at a huge studio like that and you can jump around between different departments, hey, you're lucky. You're one of the rare few because most of the time they just want a person who does weapon designs to just do weapon designs. That's it. Weapon designers, they can't design characters. They just want them to do I'm not agreeing with this. I'm just saying that's generally what happens. The bigger the studio gets, the more specialized they want individuals to be. A perfect example is that when I worked at Capcom, I was able to do voice acting and storyboarding and direct cinematics, and I was able to do character design and environment design and uh, voice acting too. Did I already mention? So I did a bunch of different things. And then when I went to a bigger company later uh, that had hundreds of employees, 
They were like, no, you just do concept. We have other people that do that other stuff. We just want you to do the one job that we hired you to do. And uh, unfortunately you can feel a little trapped doing that. That ain't my style. That's why I only did, uh, I think I only did about, yeah, 12 years of, yeah, 10 years of working in house at game studios. And then I was off on my own because I need to run a business. I need to be doing lots of different things. That's just my personality type. It's important to know who you are. And that does bring up another point with all the things that I'm talking about. Can't be pretend. You can't just put that in your cover letter. Oh, I'm really eager to learn. You have to actually show it. And what that means is like, how can you show it? One would be, uh, well, one way to show that you're very passionate about their IP and their brands is to have examples of stuff that you've done that fits their game. You know, so for example, if an animator were to send me a sample animation of a character doing a, a combo kick or something like that with the character from the game, just even if it's just sketched out, that would show me this enthusiasm. It's like, this is a person who will go above and beyond. This is a person who I won't need to hold their hand and they won't constantly be wondering if they're way off base. And, and uh, it also shows me that they have an eagerness to stand out and an eagerness it's not just a job to them. It's something that they're really going to feel passionate about every single day. That's really what I look for, you know? And, and again, I can't speak for other employers, but I can tell you, it's hard to turn somebody away when they're like, Hey, I will give you my absolute best. And I will be so passionate about it. It's hard to turn somebody away. So you have to kind of develop a personality and attitude towards the work that makes people see without a shadow of a doubt that even if you don't know something, you're going to be eager to try to be as useful as you can to making that product as good as you can possibly make it, even if it's beyond your current skill level. And yes, attitude trumps skill in my book. Uh, if a person is showing a great deal of enthusiasm to grow and develop, then that means it's only a matter of time before they do. And that needs to be ingrained in who they are. It has to be a part of who you are. And if it's not, then find the formulas that allow you to become that. Um, a person who is constantly defeatist, a person who is constantly saying, oh, I can't do that. A person who constantly shuts down their clients or says, oh, that's way beyond my skill level. Uh, or they're hesitant to even try. Um, those, those are generally characteristics that are going to lead to dead ends. Uh, those are, and, and when I say dead ends, I mean for the employer, they know that your usefulness for the project is fairly limited if you constantly have those things. Now it's different if you say, well, obviously my strength is in environments, but you know, I've always really wanted to get better at characters. And if you give me a chance, I'd love to give it a shot. Like that's a much better perspective and attitude than somebody who says, uh, no, that's stupid. I hate drawing in that art style. And, and people who do that are hacks. So just be very careful of negative attitudes. Be very careful of fatalistic ideas about the future of the industry. Be very careful of taking on a negative view of, or a fatalistic view of the direction of concept art for games, for example, if that's your specialization. In fact, it's far better to look at these things as an opportunity. So let's say, for example, you take on this attitude that, oh, the game industry is corrupt. You can only get in if you know somebody, which is not entirely true, but you can certainly find many examples where that is true. So it does help you, obviously. Well, guess what? You just answered your own freaking question. Get to know people who are game developers and use that to your advantage. If that is true, then make it part of your strategy. Instead of complaining that it's not something you already have, go out and get the thing that you need to get the kind of job and the kind of opportunities that you want. New tools in your, your trade can actually speed you up rather than it being something that you're threatened by. Artists who have more skill than you are not a threat to you. They're somebody that you can learn from. Hell, even getting rejected from a job can give you indicators that you're not ready yet for that. So it gives you a reason to look at your uh, work and evaluate how can I present a better case for my employment, so to speak. Now we are all artists. Uh, well, not all of us. Uh, you might be a writer. You might be somebody from a different field entirely. Uh, but generally speaking, it's not uncommon for artists to feel a sense of insecurity about our work. You know, we get judged based on our skill level and sometimes we can take that very personally. And so it's very easy to fall into a mindset of believing that we're not capable uh, or to fall into negative mindsets. Ah, our, our, our work isn't popular, so we must not be that good or whatever. You know, um, it's, it's easy to fall into those mindsets. 
And here's sort of an easy way to manipulate yourself. And if you can, you, everybody knows, I think if you can manipulate yourself, then you have infinite keys to unlock all of life's potential. So here's the hack. Instead of saying, oh, I'm not good at that. It's far more powerful if you can tell yourself, I'm not good at that yet. The simple word, the simple word can change the entire context that it takes in your mind because this, the vocabulary we use is programming. The words that we use, this is why it's so important that you have the ability to say what you truly feel and what you truly want, but also to steer what it is that you want. It's so important that you have control over your words because words that you tell yourself shape your reality. So even adding that simple word to any statement of negativity can change your mindset about it. And think about the implication. I'm not good at drawing characters yet. That means you're working on it. That means that you should be working on it. It means that it's something that you're capable of. It's not something that you're incapable of. If a human can do it, you can do it. If some other artist can do it, you can learn to do it. Or you could say that um, I've been really focused on environments and characters are not my strength yet but it's something that I want to get to. That is a different attitude than somebody who says, no, I suck at drawing characters. I won't do it. This by definition is just a can do attitude. Somebody that is not going to constantly defeat uh, the goals. And, and this bleeds through into the rest of the development team. If you're a manager and you're hiring, you know that bringing in one sour apple can spoil the whole bunch bringing in one person with a fatalistic attitude can spread like a disease through the rest of your entire dialogue with your team. Before you know it, people who were extremely productive are now fatalist as well, because this person always farts in the elevator, so to speak, metaphorically speaking in meetings, they shut down everything. And that can be such a bummer, such a buzzkill and such an uh, uh, it can, it can cost you the enthusiasm of those people who are infinitely ambitious and infinitely creative and infinitely optimistic. It can cost you that. And it's not to say that you shouldn't have realistic views and that's one thing, but it's how you contextualize those limitations because most of the time it's not that something cannot be done. It's just that something has a cost and we have to address the cost of that change. And that brings me to another very, very hireable quality, which is problem solving. Someone who is capable of solving any problem. I recently started working with a programmer. We were working in the Game Maker Studio program and we decided at a somewhat of a last minute decision <laughs> over a weekend, uh, hey, why don't we just explore Unreal Engine? Let's see what we could do. And this particular person had always held this perspective. He says to me one time, he says, we can make the engine do whatever we want. We just have to learn how to tell it how to do it. And I remember that distinctly because even though this person wasn't particularly strong with programming an Unreal Engine, I knew that this is a person who will figure it out because that is a can-do attitude. That is a, an attitude of optimism. And it's an attitude that even though maybe <laughs> this person can be sometimes fatalistic, there is an infinite level of power in just saying we can figure it out. We just have to learn how to tell it what we need it to do. So even though this person is not an expert in this program, he's certainly somebody that I want to keep on the project a hundred percent. I want that attitude more than I want somebody who's an expert at Unreal Engine because a person who's an expert at Unreal Engine might be full of a lot of doubts and they might be full of a lot of uh, hey, you can't do that without this thing. Or, oh, we need to start over because we need to program the thing from scratch. Or, oh, like there, there could be tons and tons of limitations, but a person with a can-do attitude and a person with optimism, infinite optimism, can solve any problem. And and even if it takes extra time, it's, it's not fatalistic. It's not, uh, oh, we got to bury the project. Oh, we got to start over. It's we just need to approach it with the right solution. And maybe we don't know what that is. And maybe we don't know that we don't know what that solution is yet, but we're going to find it. All of this applies to art as well. Uh, when you're facing those challenges that seem like 
they're unsurmountable. Oh, how am I going to paint like this other artist? Or how am I going to get those color theories down so that I can get the kind of colors that I want in my paintings? How am I going to get closer to drawing better perspective? Every At every stage of your art journey, of your creative journey, you're going to face these questions. And if you don't have the tools to contextualize the information in such a way that leads you to success, then you are going to quit. You are going to struggle and you are going to fail and you're going to look for an exit because it's going to be too painful. So a part of you also needs to adopt the ability to endure. And that means building confidence through facing the things that are difficult. And that is the true value of experience. That is why employers are always saying, oh, we're looking for experienced developers because it's cheap. It's easy to be an armchair quarterback. It's easy to theorize about why a game shouldn't have bugs or whatever, or how to make a game better. Oh, are you looking for feedback? On a, you need a game designer? I've never shipped one, but I got ideas on how to make your game better. Well, it's easy to have ideas. Ideas are cheap, but without evidence that your ideas work, without evidence and proof that you've actually finished something, your ideas are just theories. If you've actually shipped something, then you know how hard it actually is to make that magic sauce work. Experience isn't just a checkbox on your to-do list on your resume. It means that you've actually got some knowledge and skill and proven history. So get out there and make stuff. Okay, I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes on the bad attitude, on the wrong kind of attitude. Don't create a cover letter that says uh, super casual speak, like, yo, hook me up with that job, dog. <laughs> I'm not joking, dudes. <laughs> I do get those. Uh, don't don't uh, put something in your, your cover letter that says, hey, I'm in a totally unrelated industry, but I know that I could be helpful to you. I've always wanted to work in video games. I don't play them, but I've always wanted to work in game. And I know I could be helpful to you. I'll even work for free. Don't, do not take those kind of attitudes. Do not take those kind of perspectives. You need to show that you're competent and, and useful to the development of a project, that you've actually done something. If you're really, truly going to be useful, you need to show that through a, re a very competent uh, portfolio or a very competent looking demo reel and have some kind of shipped product that you've made, even if you had to do it on your own. No one opened the door for you, screw it. You kicked the fricking door down and made your own. Those are the people that get hired, the people who kick down doors and make their own products. They don't need somebody else to give them an opportunity. If they keep getting rejected by big studios, they go off and make their own indie games. If they're a comic book artist and they get rejected by the big guys, they go off and publish their own indie comics. They build their own audience. They build their own websites. They start making their own newsletters and shipping the books out to their own customers. People who are self-reliant, people who just get the job done instead of complaining that everybody else had it easier than them and they're the villains holding them back. That is a bad attitude. Don't adopt that. Nobody is responsible for your success or failure except you. That is it. But I got to tell you, man, you're going to have to work for it. Whatever you want, you can have it. But you got, you're going to have to step up to the plate. There's going to be tears <laughs> and you're going to have to suck it up and get back up on that horse because life will keep kicking you down. Competition keeps getting more and more fierce and you need to have an attitude that you can take it on. So set yourself up for some small wins until you build confidence enough to take on the bigger ones. Just like an RPG, man. Just level up first. Uh, a couple more things. Bad attitude examples. Never show a disrespect uh, specifically to the person who you're trying to get a job from. It's beneficial to show a bit of enthusiasm in your cover letter as well. I had one artist that uh, wanted to get hired. They applied and I gave them a chance and I gave them instructions. I gave them feedback. I asked them lots of questions and all of their responses were one word answers. It was as if they just were not interested at all, that they were only using this as an opportunity to make a few bucks. And of course, I pay artists for art tests. So even though this person passed the art test, we did a really good job together. I like the quality of what they gave me, but they were no fun to actually interact with. And then when I actually did line up the job, uh, they just ghosted me entirely. So that's a big one. Don't ghost your clients. I would say that one out of every 20 artists that I send a test to will just completely ignore the, that I ever wrote to them, which is a waste of everyone's time. It's like, why apply? Why, why would you even apply to a job that you don't actually really want and have no enthusiasm to do? 
Furthermore, I've also had artists who, after I gave them a test, they just didn't bother to follow up. And uh, maybe they were embarrassed because they couldn't actually do the test or they failed at the test. Whatever the case, don't do that. If you failed, at least apologize. Just let the potential employer know that you don't feel like you're ready, but here's what you gave the effort on. Here's what you actually tried to do. I would also say, try to do your best to be as honest as possible. Even though you really want to get that job, don't make up a bunch of BS. Don't lie about your resume. Don't lie about things you worked on. Don't present other people's work as if it's your own. If you used AI or you used photo bashing, just be freaking honest about it. Unfortunately, if you're a really dishonest person and you're sneaky like that, uh, you're going to burn bridges and kind of get blacklisted, unfortunately. Like, uh, many employers are probably fine with you using photos. They're probably fine with you using uh, AI art uh, as an assistant. Uh, they're probably fine with a lot of these tools, as long as the work you're actually showing is functional to what they need. And that's why I think it's more important than ever that you show your process, your creative process, so it doesn't look like you're just relying on clicking a couple of buttons and letting AI do it for you. Concept art still needs to have design with intention. We still need designers, people who will follow instructions and design something. And before my comment section gets flooded with more, hey, what do you think of AI art questions? Just watch many of my other videos about AI art. Another bad attitude is artists with huge egos. I was looking for an artist that can draw, help me draw my comic. Long before I uh, really started my business, I was just looking for an artist to help me draw my comic. And he looked at it and, and in his emails, he said something to the effect of like, oh, anime art style is so dumb and easy. I can do this in my sleep and you just draw googly eyes and he was kind of making fun of it. And I was like, wow, just you just dissed entirely. It just what a disrespect to an entire style of art as well as, you know, the artist that you're applying to. Like you're if you insult the people you're trying to get hired from, they are probably not going to think you're amazing and really, oh, what such fine taste you have that you can think that what I do is simple and lowly and dumb <laughs> and what you do must be so wonderful, right? No, no, no. No employer is going to think of you that way with discerning taste because you dissed on what they currently do. Uh, and that also means you can't try to imply that, hey, you're going to come in and fix the thing they're doing wrong. Uh, I've certainly heard enough stories from managers who've told me about artists that they had that came in and they immediately tried to change the art style of the entire game. You're an associate artist. Don't don't come in thinking that you know better than the art director. Nobody's going to think you're some genius right out of school that, hey, we should just skyrocket you past the art director. You have to show a proper level of respect for the people who are giving you a job and for the people who are giving you directions and instructions. You need to be a useful member of the team. Man, I'm sure most of you guys who listen to my channel, you guys already know this stuff, uh, but this is for, I, I gotta say it for the people out there who might not realize it, man. Sometimes if you imply that you're gonna be really difficult, they don't wanna hire people that are just going to be difficult. They're, they're going to have to wrangle all the time. If you seem like you've got a huge ego, it's not helping you. Um, you know, you can't use that to compensate for maybe some rejections that you felt for your work in the past. I think that sometimes artists feel like, oh, I have to overcompensate by talking big. I got to talk about how great I am at my job. And then other people will respect me more. No, they just think you're kind of a clown um, and maybe not worth the effort. I'd like to end on a little bit more of a positive note. This is uh, ended up being a, a little bit longer than what I expected, almost uh, 30 minutes. But uh, it's been fun hanging out with you guys and, and exploring this topic specifically. I, I feel like I have a lot more to say about it. I probably should just start doing podcasts. Uh, but certainly I, I want you to know wherever you're at, wherever you're from, wherever your skill level is, I wish you all of the success with your creative journey. I think that everybody is capable of anything as long as you're determined and passionate and you create mental pathways for yourself to allow yourself to succeed. And be careful to not create mental blockades that keep yourself from accomplishing those goals. I absolutely wish you the best. And if you are on your art journey and you need a little bit of help, a little bit of training wheels so that you can get those little wins, that's why I've created my easy art lessons over there on my Gumroad channel. These are easy daily drawing exercises. You can learn to draw in 20 days. 
No joke, it's almost impossible not to improve your art skill within 20 days. And I'm continuing with uh, all the way up to, now I'm up to lesson 30. Wow, uh, I'm gonna keep going with those. And for those of you that are a bit more hardcore and ready to actually start applying for art jobs, I've got my more professional level art workshops for environment, concept art, character design, and uh, skin design. And for everyone else, dudes, I'm here every Friday and uh, I will be back next week. So I look forward to seeing you. Don't forget to subscribe, comment, and click the bell. I guess you don't click the bell, you ring the bell. And I'll see you in the next video. All right, ciao.